welcome everyone on behalf of ISHR and all the co-sponsors. Thank you for joining us uh, today for this joint event. We have simultaneous interpretation in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. You can choose the language channel from the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen. I remind the panelists to please stay on the channel uh, of the language that you will speak in. We also have English captioning, which you can activate with the closed caption buttons at the bottom of, of your screen. The event will be recorded and posted shortly after. Um, you, if you have any questions for, for, for the panelists, please use the Q&A function, which we'll get uh, to towards the end of the, 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 the event. Now, we are very uh, pleased to be joined today by an outstanding panel, which I'll introduce now very briefly for the sake of time. And you can find their full bios in the event page, and you'll find now the link in the chat box. So we're joined today by Salima Hankins, who is the Interim Executive Director of the US Human Rights Network. Dolg Douglas Belchior, who is the co-founder of UNAFRO Brazil and the Black Coalition for Rights in Brazil. Roger Malcolm, who is the Executive Director of Jamaicans for Justice. Esther Mamadou, who is representing the implementation team of the International Decade for People of African Descent in Spain. DG Adianju, who is the convener of Concerned Nigerians Group. And last but not least, Mireille Fanon Mendes France, who is the, president's, uh, the president of France Fanon Foundation, former chair of the Working Group on People of African Descent and scholar on racial justice and decoloniality. Due to an emergency, Mireille will have to leave at 5.15. So the objective of today's event is to listen to defenders' expectations from the UN Human Rights Council on the implementation of Resolution 43-1, titled The Promotion and Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms of Africans and People of African Descent Against Excessive Use of Force and Other Human Rights Violations by Law Enforcement law enforcement agencies, officers. The resolution was adopted on 19 June 2020, following a historic urgent debate convened by the African group and unprecedented civil society mobilization with more than 660 organizations from around the world, led by the families of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Philando Casti, and Michael Brown, who called on the Human Rights Council to hold a special session and to establish an Independent International Commission of Inquiry on Systemic Racism, Police Violence, and Repression of Protests in the United States. The urgent debate was a rare moment where the Council responded in real time to social movements and the global outrage that Black and minority communities are experiencing. Despite the outcome falling significantly short of expectations, the voices of victims' families resonated and were a central part of the debate as Philonis Floyd, George Floyd's brother, delivered a historic and moving statement at the debate's very outset, urging the Council to establish an independent international commission of inquiry. Due to the immense diplomatic uh, pressure on bullying from the U.S. and its allies, the Council decided to instead mandate the High Commissioner with the assistance of special procedures to prepare a report on systemic racism, police violence, and government responses to anti-racism protests, and to share regular updates on the issue at all future Council sessions. In August 2020, 144 families of victims of police violence in the U.S., joined by over 360 civil society organizations from across the world, called on the U.N. High Commissioner to center the report on the lived experiences of people of African descent and be informed primarily by individuals and communities directly impacted by structural racism and police violence. The High Commissioner responded to these calls and affirmed to the Council that the voices of people of African descent who are victims of human rights violations and their families would be central to the work. She also affirmed that the report will examine the root causes that have enabled systemic racism and police violence. And the office has published the call for inputs in English, Spanish and French, and we prepared a Q&A document to disseminate it widely, and you'll find the links in the chat box now. So it is in this context that we meet today 
to discuss what role the council should play to support victims, their families and communities. And first, we are going to start by playing a video that was prepared by Mothers Against Police Brutality, a Victims Families Association in the US. Can we play the video? My name is Quinta Sanders. My son's name is Tory Sanders. He was murdered May 5th, 2017 in Charleston, Missouri, Mississippi County in a sheriff's department. He was murdered by the sheriffs, jailers, and also police officers of Charleston, Missouri, Mississippi County. A mother never wants to bury her child. Yes, I had to bury my son. Next month would have been his 32nd birthday. He didn't get to make it there. We paid an awful big price, not only myself, not only his siblings, he has two brothers, but also his children. We miss you, Daddy! What a big price we had to pay. Yes, their daddy won't be there to walk his girls down the aisle. Their daddy won't be there to see his sons graduate. Their daddy won't be there to take that ride with them to college. He was having a crisis. He was a medical patient, but instead of getting him help, they decided to take his life, not get him any help. We want our children to grow up with their fathers. We want our children to grow up with their mothers. No one should think they have the right to take another person's life just because you wear a badge. Thank you. Hi, my name is Beatrice Roberson. My son's name was Jamel Roberson. He was a security guard that was murdered on November the 11th, 2018 by a Midlothian police from Midlothian, Illinois. My son was a security guard. He was at work doing his job. Policeman came and my son was shot in his back four times. Although people was screaming and saying that he was security, he is with us, he's one of us. The policeman still shot my son in his back four times. I have never received an apology from Midlothian Police Department, from Robin Police Department, from the state's attorney's office in Illinois. No one, I haven't received anything from them. It's been hard. It's a horrible almost two years. I am seeking for justice for Jamel. This is my son, Jamel Roberson. It is too hard. Stop killing our kids. Hello, my name is Denise Rankin. This is my son, Deron Gaylor, who was brutally killed by Flint Police Department. My son was in a 11 and a half hour standoff held in the attic of the house, scared. My son was, um, he was, he had a depression. He was bipolar and ADD. I was there the whole 11 and a half hours where they shot him, sniped him out. The, the SWAT team was there. They sniped him out, shot him in his head. Um, they tore down the house on his body. My son was treated like an animal once they got him to the ground. Eyewitness from a neighbor said they drug my son across the grass like a dog to put him in a body bag. My son did not deserve this. You are not the judge. You was not the judge. You didn't give him a chance to get to the point where he could get a judge or a jury to say if he was guilty or not guilty. You took that in your hands. I pray that my son gets justice because my life, my children's life, his sister's brothers, his kids' life will never be the same without him. My name is Kathy Scott Likes. I am the mother of Jarvis Likes, 35-year-old unarmed black man that was shot and killed on December 29th. 2017 in Columbus, Georgia, by Georgia State Trooper Officer Michael Nolan. Jarvis was on his way to work that night, and en route, there was a DUI checkpoint set up, 
and Jarvis decided to turn around and go the opposite direction in order to get to work on time. Officer Michael Nolan saw Jarvis make the turn and decided to follow him into a residential area. Officer Nolan blocked Jarvis' car in and got out of his cruiser with his gu gun drawn on Jarvis. But instead of Officer Nolan probably just tasing him, he decided to shoot him up high instead of low. When I asked, could I go to the hospital to identify my son? The coroner told me I couldn't go and identify him, so I never got a chance to identify my son. And the next time I did see my son was his funeral on January the 6th, 2018, in his casket. My son's life mattered. My son should not have been killed. His death could have been prevented. We will continue this fight for justice for Jarvis. This video was prepared with the support of the American Civil Liberties Union. Now I'm going to turn to Salima Hankins from the U.S. Human Rights Network. Salima, the adopted resolution did not establish an international commission of inquiry uh, into the situation in the U.S. as demanded by victims, families, civil society, and special procedures. So what have been their actions of the, the network's members who supported the, the letter to this outcome? And secondly, we've heard from several state delegations during the negotiations and the urgent debate that the U.S. is a democracy, that its institutions are best placed to address these violations. Yet, as we saw in the video and in several letters to the U.N. endorsed by victims' families, they are seeking international accountability. So why are victims' families and organizations supporting them, such as the American Civil Liberties Union and the U.S. Human Rights Network, seeking accountability at the U.N.? Salima, I have the floor. Thank you. First of all, I want to say thank you to you, Selma, for the invitation uh, and just for all of your work around the urgent debate. I know it was not easy um, and to the ISHR uh, team as well. Um, I think that, you know, our members sort of understand that spaces like the UN were not created for, for them. Uh, our members are grassroots folks. They're uh, directly impacted people who are on the ground um, uh, having these uh, experiences that they don't often get to, to tell their stories before an international audience. I also wanna thank Colette Flanagan, who uh, is the head of Mothers Against Police Brutality, who pulled that, that video together, um, who she lost her son uh, to police violence as well. Um, I do think that even given the fact that we understand that places like the UN are, were not created to redress our issues, um, we still see it as uh, a worthwhile endeavor to try to stretch what is possible at the UN in the same way that in the United States, the US constitution was not created to protect people who look like me or uh, many um, people who are uh, minorities in, 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 in the US, but activists have push, pushed to reinterpret and stretch the constitution so that it is applicable to, to us and provides us with some protection. Obviously, the American legal system has utterly failed Black, uh, black folks um, here in, all er in, in, in a number of areas, not just police brutality, systemic um, um, violence, but also uh, issues that have to do with socioeconomics and things like that. So we understand that while uh, our, our government uses pretty and flowery language to say that we have structures in place that, that, um, that are theoretically should protect us, the reality is when people saw George Floyd get uh, killed and expressed shock, many in the black community in the US were, we're not surprised at all. We have been witnessing it as children growing up. I think that w there was a sort of collective triggering almost that happened with black, uh, black communities in the US around, um, around what we had seen and experienced growing up and then seeing that again on, on television. Um, I think that we, 
folks decide to engage also because it is a part of a long tradition in the United States with Malcolm X and other black activists, um, the NAACP actually going to the UN, internationalizing their issue and actually trying to connect our struggles with um, struggles with people around the world. Obviously we understand that engaging within the context of the US actually gives us a certain amount of privilege too, that we, we understand that we have a privilege and a megaphone so that even if even though we are marginalized uh, people, our issues have the ability to get attention that maybe other folks' issues don't. But we, we are inspired by movements around the world. Um, and we feel like uh, we don't, think that the UN is going to solve our issues. But it, we do feel like it's very important for us to engage because we need to level set what, um, what our standards are. And because in the US, we are not using a human rights standard. We're using a much more narrow sort of civil rights standard. It's important for us to have documented, um, documented uh, our stories um, in a place that is like not within the U.S. context because the U.S. is the, the uh, culprit. And then uh, the last thing I'll say is that video to me was very powerful and it highlights one of the reasons why people want to engage and that is people want to be able to tell their stories. In the U.S. there's not necessarily a role for the victim's family, right? If a police officer shoots someone, if they get in, indicted or held accountable at all, it's sort of the state against that police officer. And then there's a demonizing of the, the victim um, and the families don't really get a, a, an opportunity to formally tell their side of the story. So having this other um, avenue for that to happen is actually really important. Thank you very much, Salima, for, 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 for sharing. We'll turn now to uh, Maria Fanon, who's the president of the France Fanon Foundation and former chair of the Working Group on People of African Descent. And Mireille will speak in, in French. Mireille, France was uh, elected this year to the Human Rights Council, and council members are expected to cooperate fully with the council's mechanisms, including special procedures. Now, France has never accepted visit requests dating back from 2013 from the Working Group on People of African Descent, and the last visit by the Special Rapporteur on Racism was in 1995. So can you tell us about the specifics of racially charged police brutality in France, and from your experience as the ex-chair of the Working group, the reasons behind uh, France's refusal to accept uh, visit requests by, by the working group. Mira, you have the floor. Merci, uh, beaucoup, Salma. Thank you uh, very much, Salma. May I would like to thank the group Mothers Against Police Violence. To have prepared those uh, videos that would move, they were quite moving, but also raising uh, questions about impunity and murders that uh, shouldn't happen. And uh, the sorrow about their children that have been shot in their back, uh, like we have in, in France. And, and also, I would like to come back. You talk about systemic racism. I think we need to be uh, careful to reduce uh, racism uh, to uh, Afro people as a systemic racism uh, expressed by a system. We need to uh, see the causes of that racism and its structures, how it's, it's rooted in the story of slavery, uh, transatlantic slavery, colonization, and uh, all that allowed this structural racism comes from the white decided that human humanity could be divided in two uh, through uh, a policy on race that hierarchized uh, humanity since then capitalism based itself on that and hasn't changed uh, we need to be careful to come back to this because uh, we uh, miss our 
main target for our work, which is to build a policy towards racism and humanization of uh, of the world and uh, question uh, capitalism that uh, just leads uh, uh, actions uh, of war towards uh, people and towards uh, black people, migrants, and so on and so on. I wanted to focus and highlight that. I think it was very important. Uh, and to your questions that you asked me, why France refused the visit of country first, because France considers uh, that it's a human right. Uh, country has no lessons to receive from anyone and that they uh, take care of uh, human rights. And it has no uh, issues with uh, Afro-descendants uh, and Africans because they're all citizens. There's no entry point uh, to the fact of being an African, Afro-descendant or ha Arab or Muslim, Islamic. They are all citizens, so they uh, erase the problem like this. However, we treat those people uh, in a ra racialized fashion and uh, also uh, denying their right to demand and their first demand and to end, the, end this uh, structural racism and to the lack of visibility uh, linked to this. Uh, uh, an example is uh, concerns the people of Kanak and people from Kanaki, uh, which is the New Caledonia. And in this country, which is a country uh, colonized by France since 1854, the Kanak people are asking and requesting their independence. And for this, they ask uh, to be part of the, the group uh, that uh, that talks about uh, de decolonization and this uh, status of participant to this group would uh, have allowed them to uh, ask for an audit to study what uh, France is uh, implementing to obtain a decolonization. However, France could have uh, responded uh, directly, but not they used the uh, UN uh, General Secretary to uh, give an answer but uh, by fact, they should have access to that audit, but the general secretary to uh, seduce France, like you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, the, this request for an inquiry in the United States couldn't, have, uh, couldn't be held because the US and all uh, their uh, allies, uh, their little uh, doggy followers, they're uh, all uh, ready to uh, violate uh, human rights fundamental human rights. So the general secretary said it was not possible that they could obtain that audit when when the, the UN takes uh, say the contrary. So this example uh, shows that when there's a demand, legitimate demand, like the right to life, like in the case of the mothers and uh, all the cases of uh, political assassinations, uh, led by uh, state and the police, uh, we see that all those uh, demands are left aside because since the beginning of the humanity in which we create, oriented by modernity, uh, by the center, there's no place for uh, Afro-descendants and Africans. This explains why France is not considering uh, to have a special uh, eye on those people and that's and there's also and it's an issue that uh, uh, requests a study that I will, i'll work on in the near future in uh, martinique in uh, reunion or in guadeloupe uh, we considered those people in the 1970s that caused too many uh, people because they were not educated there was a uh, over uh, population uh, over natality uh, to po much poverty, we we uh, decided to create a department, a service of immigration, um, uh, uh, which has the goal to uh, bring uh, 
people from the Antillas to uh, come to uh, France uh, to be educated and formed and capacitated. Uh, but they were uh, they were educated like uh, uh, domestic uh, attendants, uh, 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 lower kind of uh, jobs. So we observed that uh, uh, we observed that uh, Afro descendants couldn't uh, have uh, jobs that where they could assume and take on like, responsibilities. In that in the, in that time, we called them as migrants. And today, the jobs in of responsibility in uh, French institutions in uh, Guadeloupe, Martinique, uh, Guyana, they are held by uh, people coming from the center, from the metropolis. When we talk about this and when we want to uh, deep, uh, go deep inside those issues, uh, study them, uh, like we refer to MSSR when they talk, uh, talked about uh, genocide uh, by substitution, how this phenomenon of substitution from a people by other people, uh, 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 su uh, substitution of indigenous people by others, uh, it's an act of uh, colonization over uh, black bodies. Uh, and this also explains- uh, I, I want to ask you another question as well, <laughs> so if you can wrap up. But this explains also why the police, at the end, allows itself to act as it the way it does, because uh, police is a repression tool for by the state to control the law, the state's law. Uh, but in fact, when they act, they take action against Arab or black bodies, uh, they know very well they will be systematically protected because by fact, uh, the state is racist and racializing. So the police doesn't have to justify its actions. Uh, moreover, if uh, those actions uh, are focused on black bodies, that it doesn't need to be just, justified because it's integrated in the collective consciousness that uh, black bodies uh, are invisible and uh, count less than others. There are elements that are change, uh, changing. And I believe that that mobilization uh, around uh, Black Lives Matter and George Floyd, I believe uh, that they uh, were able to move the borders, the frontiers, but, uh, but the state uh, has been condemned uh, in cases of uh, police brutality towards uh, youth in 2015, uh, where there was a complaint of being systematically uh, uh, controlled, uh, impeached to excess, exceed, and, and insulted in the installations of police. Uh, so there's uh, the dozens of uh, young people uh, lodge a complaint. And so the state, uh, because that's the state that was responsible for the, the police, uh, was condemned for uh, violence against these uh, young people. When it relates to uh, youth uh, over the years, and the issue has increased over the years, uh, no policeman was condemned. Uh, or maybe one or two, but that's it. Uh, and they've been, they've been uh, a shift to other uh, workplaces, but they have not been taken out of the uh, police force. So uh, all this comes from our history, our common history, that one day we decided that race was a determinant that divided uh, so everyone uh, from each other. Thank you so much. Can, if I can just ask you one, yeah, just one more question, and I want to uh, take advantage of the of the time that you're uh, with us here. So you you also um, uh, conducted a, a visit with the working group to 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 the U.S. However, many of the recommendations of the working group were are are, are yet to be implemented. So how do you think the council can increase the pressure on on the U.S. government to end the structure and systemic racism? And I thank you for for unpacking that and and clarifying that. 
that. So that's one. Uh, and then regarding France about um, the, the political will and so on. So how do you think that the report and this process can meaningfully address the situation as well in, in, in France? And how can the council contribute to bringing these uh, changes? Um... Si, si c'est un, euh, si un rapport euh, sur... Euh... Hey, we talk ah. about this report. Oh, I am, sorry, I have some interference with... Uh, OK, sorry. I switched in French, sorry. Um, si... I switched to French. Sorry, I had some oh, difficulties here. Do. If the report would have been uh, as requested by families and organizations, meaning a, an inquiry on the ground, we could have expected something. However, today, uh, uh, the High Commissioner even uh, gathers a lot of information. It will only repeat what uh, we already uh, revealed in many reports on the situations of, of, of Afro-Americans in the US. There was a visit in a country visit in 2011 and 2016, and and in 2016 we uh, could observe that no recommendations from uh, 2011 were implemented. So now, if we look at this process, uh, we we uh, are sure that the 2016 recommendations were not e uh, either uh, implemented. Uh, I think the situation is same is similar. Uh, between all occidental countries that were colonizers. Uh, and let's not forget that US is, uh, is still a colonizer. They're still occupy lands that they don't belong to them. So we need to be very careful of not waiting uh, and expect more than what we can expect. Uh, at the end of the day, we're in a system that should be multinational, the UN, uh, which is not uh, any more uh, multilateral, they are captured by uh, transnational corporations and big uh, finance institutions, uh, and states are uh, submitted to uh, the interests of that uh, financial system and big corporations. The system has always been uh, under that influence, uh, interference. Uh, the UN for the white people at the end of the Second World War. Uh, UN was founded by white for white because the rest of the world was colonized. The rest of the world was not um, brought to be free at one point. The system was made by them for them. So Africa, the Asia, no have no voice because the Security Council is held by five big countries that have uh, white thinking, occidental thinking and they don't think about uh, the situation uh, for the sand and the situation of migrants of Africans and children. Uh, that's not their concern. That's not their objective. If we really want, and that's a connection in, at the UN level, when we discuss there's a re real will to advance and make progress, but we see there's nothing uh, put in place to uh, progress uh, because we're not in a system in favor of uh, change of paradigm uh, on domination and France uh, plays a role to delay uh, so because because of the murder of uh, of George Floyd like many other murders the French should have intervened and and press on the US no uh, we I uh, I support the demand of the African group, uh, not, not only because friend has uh, doubtful relations with African countries, the relation Afri Africa France is not ended, uh, but the friends should have supported the African group uh, in its request for real uh, inquiry to arrive to solutions, to uh, resolutions, to recommendations that can have an impact substantive impact on the life of Afro-Americans. And at the same time, uh, for uh, the US, uh, United Kingdom uh, uh, still are the, a model uh, for all on uh, regulation, on health, on public policies. 
the U.S. model is still a model to uh, to set aside and apart from. Uh, so so we see that the France could have played a different role, but she doesn't want to play a different role because they are is immersed in that uh, problematic of uh, immer and immersed in the, that domination domination and uh, system and uh, and transverse by uh, race race uh, the process is a collective process uh, legal process that should allow to open the issue of structural racism and redistribute what has uh, been taken to land, to water, and also develop international relations not based on inequality, but on equality between states in order that uh, that uh, request uh, raise on uh, police brutality in the U.S., that kind of bycrase should be uh, approved and, uh, and not set aside. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mia, for, for sharing uh, all these insights with us. And I understand that you have to leave early. So I thank you again for, for, for your time. So now we will uh, turn to uh, Douglas Belchior, who uh, is representing you know, Afro-Brazil and Black Coalition for Rights in Brazil. And he will speak in Portuguese. So Douglas, uh, systemic and structural racism and police brutality against people of African descent is also rampant in, in Brazil. So can you explain briefly the context Context and the current situation in Brazil, and also how do you assess the Brazilian uh, Brazilian government's national policies to confront racist police violence? Douglas, you have the floor. Muito bom dia, Salma. Bom dia a todas. Good morning, Salma. Good morning, everyone who's watching us. Well. Brazil is the result of 400 years of slave trade. The Brazilian society, over the past 132 years after slave trade ended, Brazil is a society that is structured so as to maintain the white hegemony and racial structures in the country. According to the colonizers' mindset, those who have taken over our country for more than 400 years. This is the economic drive behind our society. The constitution of the Brazilian Republic reproduces the historical violent racism in our country. Private institutions do the same, and that is also valid for public institutions. Never have we had programs or government policies that could really address the issues regarding poverty, inequality, and other problems. As I said, we've had over four centuries of slavery in our country and enslaved people have worked hard to build our national wealth. They have worked their land, they have created wealth for the country, but never have we had an agrarian reform in the country. After slave trade ended formally, a new system was created one year after slave trade ended in 1888 during the empire regime under the Portuguese crown rule. What we saw that the very following year, the Republic was declared and the constitution was created. And the idea was to create a democratic society under the Republican regime. However, black people never had access to rights. Black people account for 80% of people in impoverished situation in Brazil. We've never had policies to address those issues. Much to the contrary, the Brazilian state and the Brazilian government has always been the greatest enemy of black people. Brazilian government has promoted human rights violation. On the one hand, they deny social rights and human rights to these populations. They deny public investment to people, especially black people. And on the other hand, there is an overinvestment 
in phallic policies, repressive actions, and armed forces. This is the only public service that works in Brazil. This is the only service that actually is truly present in impoverished areas and black communities in Brazil. We hit violence records at all times. And we report that the black movement in Brazil we see in Brazil, black people are going through a genocide process. And we want to stress that concept because internationally speaking, there is a whole debate around this concept, but that's what we see in Brazil. There is a deliberate action in the state on a daily, on a daily basis. And that's also part of our history. Black people are murdered masses are murdered because of racial issues. I'm talking about indigenous populations who have been victims of such genocide. And at the same time, African populations and their descendants suffer from the same thing. Just so you have an idea, during the pandemic in Brazil, we hit records. I'm talking about the pandemic during the coronavirus lockdown. In the first half of 2020, we hit an all-time high in the number of people that were murdered by the police. This happened during the pandemic. The population was trying to follow the guidelines that were set by healthcare institutions. We were trying to stay home, but we've seen iconic cases, polices that just invaded homes and murdered people inside their own houses. In Rio de Janeiro state, we've seen cases where children were murdered. That was the case of João Pedro. He was an eight-year-old boy who was brutally murdered by the police in his home. He was home following the guidelines of Brazilian authorities because of the pandemic, and he was murdered nevertheless. In the first half of this year, there was a 24% increase in the number of murderers by the police in Brazil. So in six months' time, during the pandemic, 3,148 people were murdered by the police in Brazil. These numbers are staggering. Every 23 minutes, a 20-year-old black person is murdered in Brazil. 75% of everyone who's murdered by weapons in Brazil are black people, and the current government motivates these people to buy more weapons. Regulations were approved, and therefore the population has more access to weapons. The amount of ammunition bought in our country hit an all-time high over the past one and a half year. We are now arming our population. This is a racist population that brutally uses their weapons to kill black people. There is a deliberate action from the state using official forces and armed forces that brutally act against black people. Roughly 80% of everyone who's murdered by the police in Brazil are black people. On the other hand, we're now incentivizing the civil society to buy weapons and guns. And those who have access to guns in Brazil are usually people who have a high purchase power, people who can spend money buying guns. They are naturally conservative people, white people that have easy access to guns, which comes to show how dramatic the future of black populations is in Brazil. So this data, are, this data is open. They were made public and we've been notifying that to international courts, but we do not see that the UN or the OAE has firmly questioning the political actions of the Brazilian government that has a person who's a genocide in charge of the country, Mr. Jair Bolsonaro, who's fully in line with the most conservative and fascist types of thought on earth.
Obrigada, Douglas. Desculpa, pra... thank you very much, Douglas. Sorry, there we go. Sorry, uh, thank you very much, Douglas. And I'm sorry, I have to uh, be more strict with the time because we want to hear uh, everyone's in interventions. But before we, we we move on, we want to uh, play an intervention uh, that was recorded by Diana Blanco Asendra, who is the founder and director general of Ele uh, Elex Acción Jurídica Colombia, on their expectations from the report. Can we please play the video now? Saludos a todas las personas presentes en este evento. Greetings, warm greetings to all people in this event. Uh, from Colombia as part of our organization, ELEX, which is a non-governmental organization that works with uh, police violence in our country. We are very happy, we are glad to be in this event as we are uh, aware of the resolution 43 that one, as we know, what are the pertinent uh, measures to take regarding the African descendants populations and the response of government institutions towards the Pacific communities. So we trust that this debate space and the report that will be consolidated will be a first step to actually respond to the Afro-descendant communities in America regarding the police brutality that is a consequence of the systemic racism that is also based on the government structure. So we call upon the urgency of these spaces, especially this report, to include the historic perspective as well as the social and economical perspective of Latin America because we believe that within these contexts, if it is true that there are some extrajudicial um, situations such as the excess of force, of law enforcement force, we believe that this is affecting the Afro-descendant communities. We know that there is verbal uh, violence and different types of violences and we know that some of these types of violences have been recorded in the report that have been collected by this organization. These different types of violence have shown or have proved that there is a systemic violence towards the Afro-descendant communities. We will also call your attention towards the statistics on this topic that is affecting the Afro-descendant communities, since it is very difficult to collect information on this topic, since many of the official records do not collect information in this regard. One of the most affected communities by this type of violence is the group of transsexual community that are also within the part of the black community. So we trust that this report is going to have a perspective uh, of gender based as well as a racist, racist base, as we believe that this is one of the most exposed communities to this type of police brutality, given the high levels of poverty and unemployment that is forcing these people to work in the streets as well as the lack of the guarantees to receive this kind of demands in front of the government institutions. Right. Thank you very much. So now we will turn to Roger Malcolm, representing Jamaicans for uh, for justice. Roger, in context where the population is of majority majority of people of African descent, the racial discrimination framing for police brutality can be incomplete. And your organization is providing legal support to victims of police violence in Jamaica, where predatory policing, police killings, and impunity uh, is a systemic problem. So can you briefly explain the context and the situation in, in Jamaica and in particular, what are the structural issues that lead uh, to uh, the police violence and impunity? And also, um, is the framing of the resolution and, and the report, uh, as well as the special procedures recommendation of, of addressing uh, systemic racism and law enforcement globally, especially where it relates to legacies of colonialism and transatlantic slavery. Is this framing relevant in the context of Jamaica and the English-speaking Caribbean? Thank you. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you, Selma, and thanks for putting this on. So I'll start by explaining the context in Jamaica. Um, if anybody studies police homicides globally, 
um, you may have come across the fact that Jamaica um, has an extremely high rate of police homicides and an extremely high rate of crime. And so we have, we were once called the murder capital of the world. And I think at one time we were close to war zone rates of police homicides. Just to give you a context of where we are right now, which is so much better than where we were 10 years ago. In the past 10 years, Jamaica has recorded um, about 1,000, 500, the last official account was 1,499 as of today I looked. So, you know, depending on that 1,499 to 1,500 um, cases of police killings over the past 10 years alone. That averages to about 150 persons um, killed by police per year that we know about. Um, and if you go longer, that number will get higher. There are years when it was 200 and odd, um, you know, e even the 300s um, over, the, over our history. And so in the past 10 years alone, we're looking at an average rate of 150 persons killed by the police each year, you know, oftentimes questionably. But we have a population of 2.9 million people. Um, so let's compare that for persons in perspective. Um, New York City, not states, just the city, has a population of, when I looked online today, 18.8 .8 million people. So you can fit six Jamaicas, 6.4 Jamaicas, or whole country, just in New York City. Um, I mean, I looked, you know, did some research on just police killings in New York City, what data I saw, and, you know, other activists may have other figures. Um, an updated report from the health department had 105 persons killed by the police over the past five years. So roughly 20, 25, you know, on average a year over the past five years. And so when you put that into perspective, um, we on average kill 150 persons, police kill on average 150 persons in Jamaica over the past 10 years. You can fit six Jamaicas in New York City. Um, and that our yearly average was smaller, it was larger than the total five-year count in New York City, according to this data from their health department report. So we, we, we realize that in Jamaica, we have an extremely severe problem with police homicides. Um, one of the, some of the structural issues that support that are, 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 first of all, a very more subtle issue of the attitude, which is human rights and human rights-based policing remains a contestable subject in Jamaica. You know, there's still debates that we have this year alone, you know, major debates in parliament as to whether or not we should trade our rights to fight crime. The government of Jamaica has actively promoted restrictions on rights to fight crime over the years. And this is the message sent to the state's law enforcement branch, um, which has since the beginning of law enforcement in Jamaica, which I'll get to in a second, has largely been about suppression and control. Though there are attempts to make things better and the people themselves in the systems oftentimes don't want it to end up that way, the culture of policing is extremely brutal and extremely violent. And we look on killings oftentimes as the number to watch, but I would say tens of thousands of cases of assault, unlawful detention, general abuse and, and, and mistreatment, um, oftentimes meted out at poor Jamaicans by security forces is an everyday experience for many Jamaicans. And so what does Jamaican policing look like? So Jamaica is policed largely by the military and the Jamaica Constabulary Force. The Jamaica Constabulary Force is the civilian policing, but our military has a strong policing role. And government guards that very jealously that the military should always have a strong policing role um, or should in the present context. So the Jamaica Constabulary Force um, is governed by a law that is older than independent Jamaica. So you're spotting the structural issues. Um, our Constabulary Force Act is 85 years old as of this year. So in a few years, it will be 100 years old. Jamaica is 58 years old. Um, we got our independence in 1962. So we're being governed right now by colonial legislation, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. So if our, if our legal framework for policing was a person, it would be past the life expectancy in Jamaica. And so I just give that as an example of a perspective about how relevant and current the structural model for policing is. It was created by our colonial masters to govern a colony that was really producing sugar for England and had recently emancipated slaves. Um, and it's old, it's colonial law, and Jamaica has not updated its colonial laws regarding policing, though it has promised several times. So that's another structural issue. In a structural context in 2010, after lobbying from civil society and a judgment by the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, um, Jamaica established independent police oversight 
in theory. Um, and that we created Indicom, which would be able to investigate um, and at the time arrest and prosecute in the police officers independent. Um, since then, the government went to war with itself um, regarding to Indicom and the police went to war with Indicom and the court, then we have stripped Indicom of its power. So Indicom no longer has the power to arrest and charge and prosecute police officers independently. Um, we reverted back to the system that we had prior to 2010, where the, pro the prosecutor has to rule if a police officer can be charged, you know, and that's a unique thing that happens just for police officers. So if I were to commit a crime right now and the police have evidence of that crime, the police could come and arrest me and throw me in jail for that crime. If our independent police oversight body finds that a police officer has committed a crime, they have to then go to the prosecutor and the prosecutor has to rule as to whether or not they could even be charged. Um, and if they're charged, then the police will then have to arrest them and bring them to court, the same police um, that are being overseen. So you see the system doesn't really work anymore. Um, it had never worked to begin with, but there were promising ideas when Indicom was established after um, a really tragic case um, that went to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights where they found that Jamaica had no credible way of investigating police homicides. Jamaica attempted to create this and on its anniversary of 10 years, um, we've seen that after years of litigation and political attempts to totally neuter the body, um, they were successful and now we don't have any real independent police oversight. Really briefly, victims and their families, as, the, as one of the previous speaker mentioned, are largely unsupported. They don't qualify for legal aid and unless an NGO picks up their case, it's sort of hopeless for them. There's no state support to deal with these issues. And prosecutions remain selective and inconsistent um, when they are prosecuting police officers. So that's in a very, very small nutshell our structural setup. Um, to the second question about, and this ties in now to the structural issues about the, 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 the relevance of this racism framing and the colonial framing, I want to give you a little bit of history. It, it will help make the message clearer. So in 1865, that's how far back we have to go, um, but you'll see why. It's not ancient history. Um, Jamaica had the Marat Bay Rebellion. Marat Bay Rebellion was in short an uprising um, of black people who were previously enslaved. Um, we got emancipation in 1838. And so, you know, emancipation occurred. The formerly enslaved persons kind of left the plantation and tried to make life for themselves with nothing. And the state largely tried to overtax them and deny them of justice and get them to work back on plantations. So it was a hard time. This is 30 years after emancipation, 1860. And so there was the Marat Bay Rebellion, and the Marat Bay Rebellion was essentially an uprising, a march from Stony Gut, St. Thomas, which is close to where I am right now, um, to the governor's, the, the capital of Kington, which at the time was Spanish town, um, to speak to the demand of the people to speak with the governor, because we were not an independent country, but a colony with an English person as our governor. And the governor refused to see them. But um, because of the uprising, Governor Ayer, that's his name at the time, um, had more than 900 persons rounded up and slaughtered. And two of those persons are our national heroes. And there's a mass asking, grave. Yeah, to wrap up, uh, to, to, yeah, to try to. So, so bottom line, the Jamaica Constabulary Force was created right after the Marant Bay Rebellion to prevent that from recurring. And that's this police force we have right now. So it was created according to the police's own website, just to read that, I think it's useful. They said the Marant Bay Rebellion demonstrated the vulnerability of peace and law in Jamaica and called for the need for the establishment of a police force. And that's what this police force is. So our police force in, a la in my last two sentences was created to prevent the uprising of persons like they did in the Marant Bay Rebellion. And that's why, unless we revise it totally, we will continue to be governed by colonial and racist models of policing because that's where they came from. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, Rodji. Um, now we will turn to Esther Mamadou, who is representing the implementation team of the International Decade for People of African Descent in Spain. Esther, your organization has recently uh, published a report on police violence during the confinement period in Spain. So can you tell us about how policing in this period has affected Africans and people of African descent, and in particular women, and more generally about the context? You have the floor. Thank you, Sama. Thank you to you and your team for organizing and for the, the invitation. So yeah, so the report was, uh, it was drafted during the state of alarm uh, in Spain uh, in collaboration with Rights International Spain. 
and we launched the report on the 6th of June, just after the lockdown ended. It's called the COVID-19 health crisis, racism and xenophobia during the state of alarm in Spain. Basically, this report was drafted as a response to make visible the impact of confinement measures on racial and ethnic groups who already face structural and institutional racism in Spain. And we were all confined um, and we gather information via Google form, via phone calls, email, video footage, testimonies during six weeks. It was hard because of the heavy restrictions in Spain, because as you remember, the, the Spanish Spain had the, one of the toughest um, lockdown in, in Europe. And with this report, we demonstrated two things. The first one is that um, it is possible to collect data even confined because the COVID-19 crisis and the restriction is still an argument used by the government equality bodies to justify the lack of data collection. And the second thing is that it demonstrated the existence of uh, racism of, of the state upon uh, black, brown bodies, people of African descent, Muslims, and also Roma communities that was exacerbated with the argument um, that by the law enforcement bodies of been enforcing the lockdown for the common good and to keep of us all safe and for reasons of public health. So after uh, six weeks, I'm going to uh, go briefly about the key findings. After six weeks, we reported more than 70 racist incidents and institution, institutional discriminatory practices that took place. The report includes recommendations to the Spanish government and a call to the Spanish government to put an end to racism and, and xenophobic manifestations at all level of social and political life. Um, it's important to, to note that most of the state violence in this report um, is committed by the national police, less by local and regional law enforcement bodies, but actually the top two uh, most violent um, police bodies are the national police and the urban, urban guard, it's the Guardia Urbana from Barcelona. The region when, uh, where uh, we had more um, police violence cases, the highest one is Madrid. We had 40% of the complaints coming from Madrid, 21 coming from Catalonia, and 8% coming from Euskadi. And the group suffering most of the police violence uh, is the group uh, that identified themselves as black or African descent with 30%, followed by Arab and Muslim 30% and Roma communities with 25%. So basically we also documented um, several episodes of uh, racial profiling or people were going to buy some medicines, uh, they were going to uh, buy the basic goods. This, those police controls provoked uh, fear mode among the people affected, the people start to self-isolate it further. It was preventing them from uh, going to uh, get by basic goods. We identified that people who had been racially profiled, they were pushed, beaten, insulted, pointed out with guns, which is very unusual in Spain because we have a strong um, gun control policy. And we saw how police violence increased in the name of public health and safety. 70% of the respondents uh, on, the, on the survey reported um, being racially profiled before being subjected to police brutality. So we have cases of police officers uh, detaining people with mental, mental health issues. In one of the cases, uh, an African man was stopped by the police. Uh, he has a mental health issues. His, his mother came out, both of them, and they detained by the police and the police officer um, re responded to the woman saying, even the crazies have to stay at home. So this is the, the things that we're dealing in, in Spain in the context we are. Of course, um, within those communities, the, the street vendors were more affected, domestic uh, workers, migrants in uh, administrative regular situation because they were facing detention, possible deportation, um, refugees that already come from a violent uh, national context of flee persecution and flee uh, ill treatment and torture. Um, and also the, the, um, the aggregator workers who were either abandoned by the administration or harassed by, by law enforcement. So in, in the case of women affected um, by, this, by those, uh, this police brutality, the women working in the uh, in domestic and informal sector were deeply affected because they didn't have the permission to circulate in the city, they were stopped. They were worship profiled, they were detained, 
uh, they were losing their incomes, they were put, being putting, uh, put at risk of becoming more vulnerable, um, losing access to housing in the middle of a, of a pandemic and the lockdown. One of the, there is a case of a woman of African descent who went to the police station to complain about an, a, another aggression and she was threatened at the police station of being beaten and she was barred from, ent for, from entry the, the police, the police um, station. So the, what, is, what became also very problematic is the fact that documenting and recording police violence was also used as a reason to inflict more violence uh, from officers entering the flats and the houses without a search warrant to beat up people that were recording their actions from the balcony. And we also have to remember that we in Spain, we are also the uh, European country, so we have the context of um, violence of law, enfor law enforcement at borders in the context of migration and detention of migrants. Um, so as an example, uh, there is a case that was uh, is, is recently in the news of the case of Samba Martin, which uh, uh, it's a Congolese woman that was in detention center in 2011. Uh, she was HIV positive and she died in, in, in detention after 39 days. Um, she requested to go to the doctor. She requested to have access to, to health. And the, the, the only way she went to the hospital when, was when she, she, she died. So um, even though the administration has recognized the civil liability, the doctor was acquitted and it's been labeled as a bad, as a bad practice. So those decisions, we see that they are uh, problematic because they set um, precedent for, for impunity uh, in, in what is uh, everything related to violation of human rights at the uh, southern border. So this is the, the major findings of, of the report and uh, you can find it on, on the website on, the, on Rights International Spain. Thank you so much, Esther, for, for sharing. So last but not least, now we turn to Nigeria. Uh, Deji Adianju, who was uh, representing Concerned Nigerians group. Deji, the urgent debate and uh, the, the the report were led by by the African the African group. Yet law enforcement agencies across the continent continue to systematically kill and torture Africans, and Nigerians have taken to the streets to demand an end to police brutality. So, can you tell us about the current situation in Nigeria and what can states and and the UN human rights mechanisms do to support your struggle? Well, basically, thank you so much for having me. And uh, basically, I'll be speaking about the issues about police brutality and all that is happening over here. Um, in uh, just briefly giving an overview that the police in Nigeria, you know, is a, basically a creation of the colonial uh, masters who came to uh, Nigeria, you know, and even the police act that uh, we have been governed with for decades now was a colonial uh, creation until recently that we just, I think about last year that we had an amendment of the police act. You know, So uh, pre-independence, pre it was the police act and post-independence, which is over the last 50 years, we've been using the uh, colonially created police act, which if you look at many provisions of, the, of that act, you know, is oppressive in nature, you know, is uh, dictatorial in nature. You know, it does not see police officers as people who are employed by the taxpayers. And the, in terms of accountability, you know, and patriotism to the Nigerian people, the police uh, act, which is the law governing the conduct of police officers, you, you know, do not in any way, you know, put the people first. So it has been a challenge to get the police as an institution you know, to conform with democratic practices, you know, uh, treaties, uh, UN, all the provisions for fundamental human rights in the UN Charter, and all the other several uh, charters, whether it be on economic rights, whether it be on uh, social political and all the other treaties. It has been a challenge, you know, and so the police in Nigeria has been has not really been a friend of the people. You know, they've been the oppressors of the people. And that's why there's a local saying in Nigeria that if you see an armed robber, you see a police, that sometimes you are safer with the armed robbers. Sometimes you are safer with the kidnappers because, and, and you know, you, you, if you go on the internet, you see many comic, uh, you know, depictions of 
the police, and all the struggle. However, let me give you a proper uh, insight into why you know, the NSAS campaign, which we started around 2016, 2017, uh, our organization, that of uh, Shegun Awosanya, and a few others, we started the campaign in 2016, 2017, why it has gained global momentum. And in fact, uh, the hashtag has surpassed that of Black Lives Matter. The reason why it is so is because, you know, instead of the police, you know, reforming, instead of the police uh, self-auditing, instead of the police, you know, self-regulating, the police have gone rogue, they've gone haywire, you know, and the issues that we were raising were not just about police reform generally, was where the issues we raised was for the laws to be changed, which was done about last year or so. We're also raising issues around salary remuneration for police officers because, uh, in fact, the condu condition of service here is terrible. You know, it's unbelievable that police officers, you know, uh, majority of the police officers, they earn less, they earn less than, uh, because if you look at the salary of police officers, it's so that many of them earn less than $200 per month. So you can see that, and you're giving, you give them AK-47 to hold, so you've, you, you're simply recruiting them to, to do armed robbery, kidnapping, and several other such vices. So the, the, there has been there, there has been a lot of um, uh, special tactical squad of the police unit, which the Nigerian people have had serious problem with. One of them is the special anti-robbery squad, popularly called SARS. You know, this rogue unit of the police, they are experts in torture of citizens, extrajudicial killings, extortion. They arrest people, they take them to the the, 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 the ATM and their banks to extort them. They stay and we lay people on the road. You know, they go, they abduct people like arm robbers. They, they do not have any known uniform. They, they are usually dressed in mufti and they carry sophisticated uh, rifles, AK-47 and all that. So, and so people dread them. They are very, uh, they're very, brutal, they use maximum force, they, they, they indiscriminately shoot and kill people on the streets. You know, so Nigerians have been witnessing this for decades. And therefore, when the campaign started in 2017 with some rallies that we led, you know, people did not take, take it serious. But you know, with the help of the internet, we, we have a new generation of, of activists who are just primarily on the internet. So with the advent of internet and the sustained campaign, you know, that we have done over the years on the end police brutality, we're able to get the buy-in of not just other countrymen and women, but, you know, pop uh, music, musicians, movie producers, directors, members of different groups, vulnerable groups, feminist, feminist groups, all kinds of groups in the country, you know, and even public officials, because several people were not being killed extrajudicially, you know, in broad daylight, and the videos found their way to social media. But because there's, a, there's, there's almost a complete failure of government in Nigeria, the judiciary has almost failed com comprehensively and completely. The executive arm of government has completely collapsed and failed. The legislative arms of government has completely failed and collapsed. They all they are good at doing here in this, especially the legislative arm of government, is passing repressive bills. They have considered for the third time now it's anti-social media bill. So because of the comprehensive failure of government, social media has become the last hope of the common man. And when the people can, in fact, freedom of assembly here has almost become a crime. I myself I have been arrested time and time again. I've been jailed time and time again by the government of the day. And, and like I popularly say that the government here is in love with me because they love to jail me. You know, however, aside attacks, because I, I have also been attacked, physically almost killed, I think December last year by, by pro-government uh, agents. You know, aside the physical attacks, you know, and all the kind of extrajudicial killings we witness here, the social media has become the most potent tool for activism in the country. So with the use of social media for activism in the country, you know, majority of the violations, just like we saw during the, 
the cold-blooded mother of uh, of um, the um, of um, the, uh, what was his yeah. name again in, in the U.S. Yes, and yes, and can you also uh, wrap up? Have... Okay, yes, the cold-blooded mother in the U.S. that we've seen on social media. You know, so we, we were able to highlight all those atrocities here on social media, and it gained the required traction. You know, and that is why the NSAS movement has become a global thing. Yes, it has been aggressively resisted by the government. Protesters were harassed. Uh, soldiers shot at peaceful protesters in Lagos, in, in Lekki, in Moshin. Uh, government uh, sponsored thugs attacked protesters he, right here in Abuja. And many comrades were injured. Many protesters were also killed in Lagos. However, the take home has been the continuous resistance by the people. Uh, uh, solutions that we would propose, you know, that would be suggesting are very simple. Number one, for, uh, for, for, police, for us to have, you know, a comprehensive analysis of what is going on, we must look at institutional reform in a holistic manner. That's one. Number two, aside institutional reforms, we must also ensure that the welfare of police officers must be taken into cognizance. Number three, uh, repressive bills, repressive bills which seeks to curtail freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, and ability to use the, the internet, which is one of the most effective tools to, to, to bring an end to police brutality, must be challenged. Again, the UN system, which is most important, they must move beyond just um, urgent appeals, which is what the UN system does. They must move to activating restrictions on those who undermine democratic process in the country. For us, our organization, we started an advocacy called Visa Ban Advocacy, which we write letters to various embassies in the country, the US, UK, EU, Canada, and, and others. You know, and it works. It seriously works because the politicians here, because they are not accountable to anybody here. So imagine if the UN places restriction on them and they cannot speak at all UN events. Anyone who allows police brutality to take place in their country or extrajudicial killings of citizens, they cannot speak at UN events. Okay. They cannot address the General Assembly and, and things like that. So those are the kind of suggestions that we will be making. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Didi. So I really have to be way more strict with, with time because we want to leave at least a couple of minutes for, for questions. So for the second round, five minutes each, and I will interrupt. So, so Salima, the High Commissioner said in her first oral update uh, to, to the Council that the trends uh, of the issues raised in the resolution will guide the, the scope of the report. And although the adopted resolution did not create an investigation space specific to the US and instead mandated a global report, um, it is nevertheless a very US focused resolution because all the statements that it refers to by special procedures to the Inter-American Commissioner are about the US. So how can the report meaningfully address the situation in the US and do justice to the grievances of victims and their families? And also, what do you expect from the newly elected US administration in terms of their engagement with the, with the council? You have five minutes. Okay, I'll try to keep it, both of them brief. Um, so we, um, our organization, along with 390 other organizations around the world and 144 family members of, who are the victims, um, whose families are, were victims of police violence, sent a letter to the, um, the high commissioner's office with our expectations for how, um, what uh, the process that, that they would um, undergo to make sure that that report is effective. So I'll just list those five. Um, the first uh, demand was to center the lived experiences of Black people and provide safe and accessible opportunities for consultation. You know, it must involve modalities that provide testimony, evidence, uh, relevant information, and in a way that's actually safe for people who might be um, worried about uh, retaliation, which is a real um, concern. Number two is examine individual cases of extrajudicial killings of Black people with, of impunity uh, for police violence, including but not limited to the, the murder of George Floyd. So we want them to go beyond just in order to make re recommendations that work toward dismant dismantling structural racism. They have to look at the history of racism policing in the US and to look at the, the, um, the origins of policing to really get at the root of what was happening. Uh, number four is allocate sufficient resources 
to this effort. And then five is hold public hearings on the use of excessive force against protesters, bystanders, and journalists. Um, so that's what we think needs to happen for to have a meaningful engagement. In terms of the, now obviously we're really relieved <laughs> around the um, uh, change in administration, although we do not believe it's gonna be a peaceful transition. Um, we are looking to the, uh, we, are, we are hopeful, but also understand that the Biden it, it Harris administration could potentially uh, continue the, um, the stance that the Obama administration uh, had, which was more engagement, obviously, than the Trump administration. But again, we didn't see real meaningful implementation of human rights within the the, the U.S. Um, I, I look, taking a look at the Biden Harris transition uh, transition team, they um, their their foreign policy actually did not mention the United Nations as at all, which is a signal um, to us that. The, two activists that we really need to push that. What we really hope is that um, they, the Biden administration will rejoin the Human Rights Council, really take its uh, um, responsibility in, in terms of reporting um, around the, the treaties um, um, and engage, meaning, and meaningfully engage with human rights folks. We do understand that even though it was not mentioned in their foreign policy, um, platform that they they'd have appointed a transition team that is focused on the U U.S. missions to, to the U.N. Um, we're hoping that B Biden's track record, particularly around uh, um, issues that have to do with vi violence against women and th things like that will continue, but we want to make sure that they're not saying Black Lives Matter in name only, which is what we, we have seen happening. We want to make sure that it's meaningful. One other thing to, to realize is that we do not, uh, um, Democrats actually, the administration um, party does not have control of the Senate. And there will be a runoff, uh, a, a, two runoff elections in, um, in January that could actually shift the balance, but we actually don't know. That's also going to uh, determine how um, how effective the, the Biden administration is. And I think that's it. Hopefully I'm under the five minutes. Thank you <laughs> so much. So. Amazing, Salima. I think uh, everyone should <laughs> follow your example. Uh, so now we'll turn back to Douglas. Uh, Douglas, how do you think the report can also meaningfully address uh, the situation in, 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 in Brazil? And also I want to ask you a question about access because the UN, including the council, can be a challenging space for, uh, for grassroots movements to access and to effectively influence. So how, um, how, how do you perceive this space and what needs to happen so that you uh, can effectively engage? You have the floor. Well, historically, well, historically all these organizations are actually very much white in their majority and black communities are not well represented and they're the ones who are suffering the most so black communities and black organizations in brazil and in other countries i believe suffer from uh, issues of infrastructure of economic problems of lack of resources which makes it very difficult for us to dedicate our time to our day-to-day -day, uh, struggles and to actually try to get our voices heard internationally. But we have several organizations in Brazil who are um, represented by women in their majority, such as the Crioula organizations, Uniafra Brazil, from which I am part. And recently, we were able to build this uh, huge coalition for Black rights. And together, through this union, we are able to carry out and convey our 
uh, accusations to the UN, uh, all of uh, the violations that we suffer because of the lobby of agribusiness that is protected by the Bolsonaro's administration. And uh, these accusations that we bring forward have actually been heard now. Uh, during the pandemics, we have reached all time records, as I've mentioned, in terms of police murders. And this is just outrageous. In Brazil, we have a George Floyd every 23 minutes, actually. And we don't see the same commotion or the same reaction of outrage uh, on the side of uh, the Brazilian population as a whole. So it's only very recently that we were able to bring this kind of debate about racism to um, the media and to the um, public uh, realm, let's say. But it's 2020 already, it needs to change. We need to see a cooperation amongst organization and we need to see the engagement of wealthy and white organization. We respect them, but they cannot walk, uh, uh, talk in our behalf. We need to have our voices heard. We need to be given access to those places of power. Our black bodies need to be occupying those spaces at the UN and in other uh, establishments. Thank you very much, Douglas. Okay, so we uh, will move back to Roger. Roger, I also want to ask you a question about access, given the challenges that defenders and NGOs from the Caribbean face to, to engage uh, with the UN. So what recommendations would you give the Office of the High Commissioner to ensure that victims from the Caribbean are also heard in the process? And how do you think the, the report can also meaningfully address the situation in Nigeria? Uh, sorry, in Jamaica, sorry. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, so the first general point, you know, I wish I got to in my first point, which is the I think there's a recognition that needs to occur um, that the narrative around racist policing is correct, but incomplete when it is exported across the world. So, you know, there's a particular racial dynamic in the United States um, that has given rise to the issues in the United States. Um, you know, white police officers, black minority, white majority, you know, that kind of stuff, which just simply is not representative of the whole world. You know, in Jamaica, the police force is almost entirely black. Um, the population is largely black. It's a different type of dynamic. It still has structural racism involved, but it's just incomplete. I won't call it inaccurate, but the, if we're going to do a, a global activity on, 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 on policing, we have to start with the recognition that this was supposed to be a US resolution that got watered onto something general, and it should not masquerade as the world's reality. When it's not, it's framed as a US issue because the US has the largest voice, full stop. Um, as you know, as Douglas mentioned, we have George Floyds every day. You know, you know, it's, 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 this is, this is, we're almost numb to it, but we have to just remind ourselves that the, the narrative is not simply an export of what happens in the United States. That's my first general point. And I think approaching this global approach with that understanding may help the UN um, and the investigators to unearth the nuances of different countries. And that should be their responsibility, not simply to, not simply to carbon copy um, the analysis in the United States to Jamaica, for example. It certainly is not the same. Um, in terms of hearing voices, um, I think that one of the things that would be very important is to prioritize supporting victims in terms of hearing from them and their families. And that can be done through working through partner organizations who could convene these spaces, um, doing the time to not just send out that the UN always does some extremely long questionnaire for some special, you know, for some for some reports thinking that people are going to feel that, oh, like, unless you have a dedicated advocacy person in your organization, like my organization. And so that's just unrealistic, you know, but it's because the persons in these institutions are also not, they're operating at macro levels, supranational levels. And for this, something like police violence is something that is lived and direct and personal. It's very different than dealing with matters of just policy or, or crunching numbers. If you want to understand the trends that inform it, it actually has to be ground up. And so the structures need to be in place to facilitate that public hearing, to facilitating um, maybe other ways of fulfilling their questionnaires by, by, by having them to organizations and getting people to 
to have like workshops and people can then get the information. There are different ways if you really cared about it that are community based. And then third, in terms of how we how I can see the report being of use. One, I'm going to be very straightforward. I don't normally have much hopes for anything coming out of the UN for my lived experience. It's important for the global structure, but it just doesn't translate, you know, oftentimes to us. Um, what I think could be useful is if the report was nuanced and specific in the drivers that it think needs to be addressed. And those things could be translated into whether they come out as resolutions or as things that guide development assistance. So in, in Jamaica, the country like Jamaica, which is heavily dependent on development assistance, or police force gets most of its, a lot of its training and funding from the America or from the from UN Office on Drug or from the EU. So those bodies may rely upon agenda setting and norm stat and standard setting to inform what happens in, that, in those contexts. And so the degree to which things could be specific um, in terms of recommendations, that may help the trickle down occur. But if it's just really going to be you sort of unearthing for the world um, what we already knew when we were experiencing it, it would be nice validation, but it won't really change much of the structure. And so my final thing here is that the recommendations part needs to also include validation loops for those persons who are involved in the work. If it's just that you minus for experiences, put a few quotes on the front page, make it seem all revolutionary, but then the person's thinking about the interventions are just a few policy people who have gone to school for human rights all their life and then have spoken and hugged the mother as she cries, then that's just not going to translate to real impact. And there's a little bit of humility that needs to occur to do that well. And if they're willing to do that, then I think it could make more impact. Thank you so much, Raji, for, for your excellent uh, in, uh, perspective and intervention. So we turn to, to, to Esther. Esther, the implementation uh, team has been using the International Decade for People of African Descent program of activities in your advocacy at the local, national, regional, and international levels. So how do you think that the OCHR report can build on the existing frameworks, such as the International Decade and the DDPA, and how can it meaningfully address also the situation um, in Spain? You have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, so we've been using the, the framework of the decade and the, and the DDPA since 2018, uh, when the working group of experts came to the country visit, um, came to Spain, and it's been a useful tool to engage um, with civil society and also to engage uh, public authorities around the conversation on that there is um, institutional and uh, structural racism in Spain, which is something that is not recognized. However, I don't think it's a matter of, of framework. Uh, I think the framework is there. If you take the DDP, it's quite comprehensive in terms of how to address uh, both structural and institutional racism. We have national human rights framework, we have law enforcement protocol, we have ombudsperson recommendation that establish clearly the boundaries um, and the legality of law enforcement actions in the light of respecting the, the rights uh, for communities. And Spain is a signatory of all the human rights treaties and thirds, and we still haven't a law against racism. So the framework is there. Uh, I think it's more a matter of, of first, I would say, the lack of acknowledgement that police brutality and law enforcement violence is a manifestation of state racism. It's, it's a manifestation of state control on our community. And it's, um, uh, it's a system that benefits some groups upon others where those benefited groups are also complicit in the racism that the state is inflicting on the other groups, which is people of African descent. Um, and in Spain also uh, um, Arab and Muslims and Roma communities are, are affected. So we still have to deal here in Spain when we have conversation with, the, with the, the authorities and the quality bodies with the bad apple concept uh, in, in police violence when it's racism allowed and committed by the state. So there is a lack of publicly voicing and expressing that there is a serious problem and, and, and that promotes uh, uh, impunity and the lack of redress and, and reparation. Um, even after publishing our report, we shared the report with equality bodies, with public administration. There, there were not a single public statement for local authorities, regional authorities, national authorities, not a single apology, uh, not a single recognition that uh, um, 
said this is what is happening and we're going to recognize that as an issue because if you don't recognize recognize that as, a, as an issue, how are you going to address it? Um, and as another example, because I really want you to understand at the, at the, the point we are in Spain. So in 2004, uh, 15 men were killed on the Tarajal beach uh, in Ceuta, in the Spanish enclave. Uh, they were, they were um, swimming, trying to reach the, the offshore of Spain. They were shot with rubber bullets uh, by the civil guards. They killed them when they were uh, swimming, trying to reach the, the beach. Uh, and until now, the, there is impunity, there is no redress for the families, um, no accountability and no recognition of, of, of the crime. So. The framework is there, but there is clearly a lack of, of political will to even recognize that this is state racism and the expression of state racism is state violence. Um, so actually, if, if you, because I, I went through again the, the resolution for it, if you want, and if you take the, um, the resolution at the end of the resolution, you have two, um, Two recommendations. One is encouraging states to look into the manuals and guidelines used for training law enforcement officers with a view to identifying the proportionality of measures in the handling of suspects and other persons in custody with respect to the treatment of Africans and people of African descent. This doesn't mean anything. I mean, if you're asking the states to look into the manuals that they already had, they never look at it or if they look at it, they don't mean anything. I mean, it doesn't have an impact for us in real life. We will be killed by the state. And another recommendation was to call upon all states and all relevant stakeholders to cooperate fully with the High Commission on the Preparation of Report. What does that mean? It, has, it doesn't entail anything. It doesn't enter any positive action that is going to provoke a change. It doesn't say anything about addressing the issue. And yes, the, if you check the last report of the Working Group of Respect, which is quite comprehensive and quite detailed, um, the reports that um, it was published in, in August and it's, um, sorry, let me check. Yeah, COVID-19 systemic racism and global prostate report. The report is, it's very good. So it's good to have uh, equality bodies and human rights mechanism that, that can make visible the situation. But, um, and this, this report has a, a vision of a global vision. And I think it's one of the, to be one of the most complete uh, report by the uh, draft by the working group of experts. But it's, I, I recall what Mireille said at the beginning, if we're gonna have a report that is going to state again, over and over the situation where we at, we're not going to do much more than discussing again, the situation that we already know we already were because we produce reports, we handle reports, we use the international mechanisms. So we really need the, the, the resolutions for like this one. The, the resolution was an opportunity to say to the state, you have to first to acknowledge that there is uh, institutional and structural racism, and you have to recognize that this is state violence. So the fact that the, the resolution doesn't really call upon the states to even start by recognizing that means that we are kind of stating the situation we are living. We are uh, still being killed. We report our own killings, which is great. We make it visible, but without um, a strong statement and a strong call upon the states to recognize that this is an issue that needs to be addressed as state violence and as state racism, um, I think the expectation are quite, I don't know, I don't know the, the perfect word, maybe the status quo, I would say. So yeah, this is my, my contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. And I hope that uh, the Office of the High Commissioner's team and states are listening uh, to, to, uh, to, um, to your intervention. So we turn to now uh, DG. So uh, police brutality and uh, extrajudicial killings of, of Africans in the continent cannot also be analyzed using the same lens of, uh, of the structures of, of racialized violence against people of African descent in the US and other Western countries. And so you touched a bit about, uh, about, uh, about that, about the, the, um, the root causes that are enabling uh, state-sanctioned violence uh, through law enforcement. So if you want to add something on that, but also the same question, what, how, how can the report meaningfully address 
address the uh, situation in Nigeria and what do you expect uh, from, from the Human Rights Council to, to, to support you? Yes, what, what, what we expect from the Human Rights Council is simple. Very, because we know how things work here. When bad behaviors are carried out, the only way that it can be stopped here is when there is fear of sanctions. And you know that the law itself, what makes, it, makes law law is the fear of punishment. So the greatest way that the Human Rights Council can help us in this part of the world is to help us place sanctions on those who have erred. I know for a fact that many UN organs are funding the Nigerian police you know, and anti-corruption agencies in the country. So placing a ban or a restriction of such funding will make the police authorities to behave here. You know, the European Union is funding the police. Several UN organs in the, you know, are funding the police. So if these funds are stopped, you will see that the level of police brutality, the level of impunity, the level of illegality and unconstitutionality will reduce. You know, again, we can also help push for visa restriction. It, it has worked here. Many governors who participated in electoral violence and uh, rigging of elections have been placed on visa ban here by the United States, and it's working. You need to see the level of fear of our visa ban advocacy, how effective it has been. The chief of army staff who superintended the extrajudicial murder, mass murder of citizens at the Lekki Togate is afraid of our visa ban policy. He has reacted to our visa ban. So they must not be allowed to speak at international forums. If such restrictions are placed by the Human Rights Council, it will go a long way to bring about the necessary reform we need. Aside that, yes, there must be civil society groups. Several civil society groups are working with many police authorities. So in terms of training, you know, institutional reforms, again, we must not, overemphasize the importance of legislative action. Many of our legislators, they go to the UN systems to attend programs. If they are supporting illegality, if they are supporting suppression of free speech, they have campaigned for social media bills to be implemented in Nigeria, you know, and other such acts, they can also be restricted. Once they see restrictions, and another most effective way is you know, um, either working together, you know, or getting the, the UN system to help in impressing it upon them of, of having human rights friendly legislations. You know, legislations that will improve uh, policing, legislations that will en ensure fundamental human rights are respected, and several other legislations, you know, can go a long way to minimize the, the, the risk there is, we, we cannot end police brutality in Nigeria without talking about the welfare of the officers who are involved. Aside the welfare, you'll be sure that many of the police facilities in the country include, whether it be special anti-robbery squad, special uh, anti-cultism squad, special uh, anti-kidnapping squad, they do not have, no, none of them, I challenge, this is, this is something I'm saying on fact, that none of them have a light detector machine that they can use to, administer on suspects. So they resort to torturing suspects for a, a thing that, a simple thing that a light detector can solve. So we must work around the student reforms. You know, we must work around training and retraining. We must work with the civil society groups to ensure that some of these things are attainable. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have um, 13 minutes before we have to conclude. So I'm just going to read a couple of the questions that, 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 that came in, and then I will ask each of the panelists to make any concluding remarks and if they wish to answer any of, of these questions in, 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 in two minutes, and we'll go in the, in the same order. So one question is saying, are there discussions in your countries and concrete measures for police reform or new models for security uh, policies? And is there specific ask for the Office of the High Commissioner, whether in this report or moving forward in this regard. There's another question as well about defunding the police and moving resources to community-based responses. And there's one question about whether there's a link between gun violence in Black communities and the excessive use of force by police. And then uh, a third question about other types of, uh, of, uh, of racist intimidation and harassment and entrapment used by enforcement uh, law enforcement officers. 
answers. Uh, so Salima, we, we start with you, two minutes, any concluding remarks and to answer any of the questions. Okay, um, I guess the what I would highlight is the BREATHE Act, which is a 128 page piece of legislation that uh, was created by the Movement for Black Lives. They worked directly with communities, uh, folks on the ground to really get a sense of what is happening there. And a lot of the, the folks who are involved in the Movement for Black Lives are grassroots uh, groups. They've worked, they worked with um, uh, different types of experts. So they did this kind of investigatory process um, in order to come up with the asks. And it, the, the, the act is basically divided into four sections, um, divesting federal resources from police and incarceration. So this is kind of the, the center of the defund the police movement. It's like defund uh, the police and put those um, resources into uh, communities. And it, it could also look like when, when someone calls 911, a mental health expert is actually um, sent out to, to uh, address um, many of the issues. It's also putting money into community programs, um, addressing uh, really sort of funding communities in a number of ways from you know, transportation, education, housing, things like that. Um, so I, I think in the last one is like holding officials accountable and enha enhancing self-determination in black communities. For folks who are interested in, in that bill, they should, uh, I, I think, Google the BREATHE Act um, by the Movement for Black Lives. And it's really comprehensive. We, my organization supports uh, the Breathe, BREATHE Act. And uh, I think that what the High Commissioner's Office could do is actually take seriously uh, what is outlined in the, in the BREATHE Act and incorporate it into the report. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Salima. Douglas, um, you have the floor. Sim, uh, aqui, no, in, por todo o ano de 2019, well, direitos, all throughout 2019, the Black Coalition for Rights had great advocacy work along with the national government because the Bolsonaro administration is highly aligned with Trump's administration. And therefore, they have proposed some acts that are more radical in terms of police freedom. He released a package of new regulations that was created by their Ministry of Justice back in the day. His name is Sergio Moro. Sergio Moro was a justice that rigged the elections that elected Bolsonaro. He condemned Mr. Luis Inácio Lula da Silva so that he could not run for office, so that Bolsonaro could win the elections. And the trade-off for that was that the Justice Moro became the Minister of Justice in Brazil. And then he wanted to give more freedom for police actions. We managed to hinder that in the National Congress. The Black Coalition for Rights prevented this act from passing and from being fully implemented. That was a great win for us. He's also proposing acts regarding police actions, racial or facial recognition using technology that has now incarcerated many black people in Brazil. People are being arrested because they were recognized because of their hair, because of their curly hair. People had an alibi. They were at a certain place at a certain time and they were being punished for crimes that happened in total different places. That is also valid for laws regarding drugs. People that had very little amounts of marijuana are now being criminalized too. These are issues that we debate in the black movement in Brazil. I would also like to voice to the High Commissioner the fact that we flexibilizing them to make rules a bit more flexible so that black organizations may truly have access to the consultative status. Black organizations always depend on larger organizations so we can access 
the High Commissioner. That is just not fair. We want to have the same access. We want to have the consultative status always. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Salima, Roger, Esther, Deji, and Mirel. Thank you very much. Muito obrigada, Douglas. Muito obrigada. Thank you very much, Douglas. Um, uh, and then, Roji, please, you have, sorry, yeah, Roji, now you have the floor. Sure, um, so, you know, just to conclude, I think, um, in terms of things that could be done, I think, one, there are things that should not be done. That's actually how I would, how I would, how I would say it. So, I think, one thing that should not be done is, after this report is done, the actions and steps to be, to, to, to address it, is the domain of just like state representatives and, and technocrats. Like a similarly consultative approach that may be deployed to the development um, of the report should filter into, into any implementation. So models look like um, technical assistance to governments to, to, to implement reforms that are in line with certain principles. Um, we've seen this um, in, in other sectors when international bodies really want to see law reform and they provide technical assistance. If you're talking about law reform, that could be if the principles are wholesome and, and right, technical assistance to governments who have not prioritized law reform or don't have the this capacity, um, human resources or focus, as it is in the case of time in Jamaica, to do large scale law reform, that could be one way that, that, could, be, that could be supported. Um, highlighting very strong models of accountability um, that could be replicated in different jurisdictions are other good options. Many times you have like a lone two good lawmakers who want to support something, but it's not really clear what that is. It's clear what it's not, but it's oftentimes not clear what are evidence-based things that will work, whether community-based models that have been verified um, or models of accountability that work well. Um, I think study into those and perhaps funding um, for such initiatives, even to generate evidence, could be something that the OHCHR could support proliferation of um, good practices um, outside of just this report, because you know it's just a piece of it's just a report at the end of the day. Um, and then I think the final thing for me is an overarching comment because I really think it's important is systemic race systemic racism is a face of injustice but it, it is not injustice in itself. So if a system is unjust, its law enforcement arm will be unjust. If a system is racist, its law enforcement arm will be racist. Um, however, narrowing sometimes our view to exclusively the impacts that systems have on racial, you know, racialized policing can sometimes obscure our creativity in solutions and also obscure the bigger issue. So in Jamaica, a bigger issue is urban poverty, which is racial based, but it's really systems of how communities came to exist post-emancipation, how police are recruited. And the result of that tends to be, you know, systemic racism and, and predatory policing across the world. But I, I'm really, it's about how the justice system is organized. It's about how crimes are written, what qualifies as a crime, who is detained, which, involves racial questions which are not limited to racial questions. And so I would just want to ensure that any solution finding um, recognizes the intersection between race and other things um, that are applicable. And again, this is particularly important in a non-US context because it's a very specific US context that's not um, exportable. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Esther, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, I would say that I think we, we have in all of actions and strategies, we need to remember that this is more a question of power and of who is in charge and that the group in charge and the elite in charge is, is exercising control and violence to maintain a system that benefits some and oppress others. I think that would never be uh, forgotten. And we should also pursue more impunity and the acknowledgement of state violence upon, upon us and as a manifestation of structural and institutional racism, and maybe move away from certainly for making visible an issue that has been, has been made visible over and over. Maybe stop accepting only discussions from national and international human rights mechanism and, and demand, accept less discussion and demand more action. Um, 
because we deserve action, we deserve accountability, we deserve redress and reparation, and we should not settle for less. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esther Digi. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity to contribute. Uh, one thing I believe is that I have been saying sanctions, 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 that's the only way that we can get the right um, things to be done. So we must re re recommend to the council, you know, and also get uh, victims to speak, you know, at UN organs, you know. Uh, for me, I believe that um, the more pressure we sustain on the leaders, you know, the more reforms we are able to get in Africa in particular, and when I say Africa, uh, West Africa, we have been to almost all the countries here in West Africa. I have seen that the situation across the board is the same. You know, the system is just bad. And the only thing that they understand in this part of the world is uh, the sanctions. When the sanctions, when they know that bad, bad behavior, you know, will be punished, they will begin to behave right. There is no essence in funding the police, in UN organs funding the police, that you know daily uh, commit extrajudicial killings and murders of citizens you know and um, a situation where we claim to be in a democracy the freedom of assembly has become almost criminalized freedom of speech the same thing and so for for the un systems to work properly um, i do not completely support defunding the police because we run a strange and funny federal system of government here where the states practically depend on the center you know, so for me, I do not support defunding the police. However, I believe that we can make the situation more effective. You know, here as well, citizens do not own guns like it is in the US. You know, so people defending themselves is almost practically impossible. Yes, use of brutal force by the police regimes here are also a major challenge. And this is why the, the NSAS campaign came up with five, five or five demand uh, which I have uh, tried to uh, highlight some of them. However, in closing, I would just want to make a special appeal that at the level of the council, the engagement must be more holistic. You know, human rights defenders who are on the front line, we have a whole lot, about five human rights defenders have just run away from the country. And there are many, uh, and, and there are many more, there are many more human rights defenders who are on the run in Nigeria. So, you know, human rights defenders are in danger. Who are in danger, we must make the room for them so that you know the council can directly engage them. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very you much. For, yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're right on, uh, on time, so I'm just going to say very quickly that we urge the Office of the High Commissioner to, uh, uh, in, um, um, uh, to uh, ensure inclusive outreach, as several of the panelists said, and that the, 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 the context in each country is different and a global report to address them all um, is not, uh, is, is quite an ambitious task. So that's why we consider this report as a first step for the Human Rights Council to address the pressing issues of police brutality and systemic racism globally. And then finally, on the US, the report should have a strong US focus because that's the framing and the intention of the adopted resolution. And that we cannot forget that the families of victims in the US have demanded a commission of inquiry and international accountability. And the council needs to respond to their demands in the follow up in June 2021. So with that, I would like to thank all the interpreters. I would like to thank all the panelists, Salima, Douglas, Roger, Esther, and Digi, and, uh, and Mireille, and all our co-sponsors and the audience. Thank you all very much. And we will post will, uh, the event and, and send you the, the video links. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Salma. Thanks. Ciao. Bye, Salma. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Salim, Esther, Deji. Yeah, my brother from Brazil. Afro-diaspora Afro power. <laughs> A luta continua. A luta continua. A luta continua. Victoria Sata. Thank you. Muito obrigada, Douglas. Tchau. Muito obrigada. Tchau, tchau.